John Roach is our next speaker. Many of you know John well. He's been on television on Market to Market since 1978. John is uh, from Iowa. Uh, he began uh, his career back at uh, Lincoln Grain Company in 1973. He founded Roach Ag Marketing. And uh, his uh, nephew, Brian, is here with him today. So if there's any tough questions, Brian, who now owns half the company, will answer those. But John has a long time of experience, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. I recall talking to him on WHO radio about some of the travels he had taken to uh, inspect other areas of the world and their grain production, their marketing capabilities that are still budding and blooming and uh, could be a major factor as we move ahead. Uh, in 1995, he was honored to be one of the 16 brokers featured in a book titled Master Brokers by John Walsh, and I think you'll find that he is. Would you please welcome grain and marketing expert John Roach. Thank you, Ken. Uh, ooh. I, had, uh, I had the greatest fear a public uh, uh, speaker in this position could have, and that is an alarm that didn't go off today. And so I apologize to everybody for uh, changing the cycle. And, and uh, uh, Ken, thank you very much for moving around. Steve, I know you had to be worried. I, I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the situation as far as supply and demand is concerned. And, uh, and I think everybody's fairly aware that uh, uh, the production in this past year was a substantial record, and it's given us a real bearish supply-driven price outlook. Uh, so the question is, do we have too much ground in production? And so I guess what I'd like to do is kind of walk through the supply and then take a look at the usage. The, uh, the production number this past year, as you can see, for coarse grain, and that's all your feed grains other than wheat, uh, was a new record, uh, a substantial new record. And what people tend to do is they look at these new records the same way with wheat, is they tend to just extrapolate that on forward. Oh, man, the nerves have got me today, too. The, uh, the extrapolation of this production, as you know who are out there raising the crop, it's sometimes not as easy to do it on the farm as it is to do it on the paper in Chicago. But you can see world production uh, set a new record on soybeans as well. And so this, this potential that we're raising too many acres of crops and getting too big of production numbers uh, is permeating through the market. You can see cotton was a, was a strong crop. But we had records in every other crop, a major crop we raised in the, in the world. If you look at the crop areas, you can see the actual acreage moving over time across all of the different uh, the commodities. So we're increasing acreage, certainly. At the same time, we're increasing yields around the world. The, uh, the second thing that's been a problem to our markets this year is money flow has been negative uh, to the grain market and really to all the commodities. Uh, if you look at the uh, red line moving from the uh, left to the right, that's the uh, S&P 500, uh, where we've seen a lot of money flow in. And if you look at the line on the other side, uh, that's the commodity index, where you see money actually flowing out. So in addition to having these big supplies to deal with, we've also had a real negative attitude from an investment perspective, and that has also pushed the, the grain market uh, lower. Uh, but I think that the long-term grain and outlook, uh, oil seal outlook is actually uh, bullish, uh, and I'm looking at it from what we have to do. In order to supply the growing demand in the world, we have to raise bigger and bigger crops, and that's a challenge. Uh, the, the, the driver of that challenge uh, is population. And as you can see there, in 1999, uh, we had a population of 7 billion people in the country, in the world. Uh, in uh, 2012, it's up to uh, 8 billion people. And so how much food does a billion, and I, I worked with this word along, how much food does a billion or do a billion people eat? I'm not sure the right, uh, right verb in there, but uh, uh, let's just kind of look at it a little bit and then talk about it. And first of all, we need to understand that we're, we're at about 7.2 billion people now and counting. This is kind of an interesting uh, um, a website that you can look at and see where the growth is in the world 
uh, and, and, uh, and see the numbers that just continue to grow. This is another interesting one because I think there's a second aspect to, to market outlooks that, that we have to think about, and that's inflation. And if you look at the debt uh, clock, uh, it's a little bit scary, but with the debt increasing the way it is, you have to look forward and say at some point or another, we're going to have inflation come into the general economy. <clears throat> we have not seen that. We've had all this price move in the agricultural uh, land, uh, farmland moving up without any inflation or any substantial inflation. And so as you look at, at land values, and, and, and I know a lot of you are doing that, uh, you have to think ahead, what happens to land values if we crank inflation up in this country? So that'll be another component of what land values are worth uh, in addition to uh, uh, increased demand uh, because of increased population. Now one of, the, one of the concerns is, okay, we're going to add people, we're going to add, uh, and this is a map that goes out to 2050, we're going to add people to the world, where are we going to add them? And the first thing that popped up uh, here is that the biggest addition is going to be in Africa. The concern there is that if you're going to have these kinds of increases in these areas of the world, how are they going to pay for the food? Because these are tr traditionally places that we think of poverty and, and, uh, and difficulty in uh, being able to um, increase uh, uh, income levels. But as I searched a little bit more, what I found was that actually some of the strongest economic growth has been occurring in some of those areas. As you can see there, um, the uh, sub-Saharan Africa is expanding at about 6% per year. And you can see the expansion going on in China. Uh, the only areas that are really going to, to expand very slowly, or not at all, uh, here, this, this, this is just this past year, uh, is through your areas of Europe. And if you go out and look to, uh, a little bit further, you can see that the developing countries are expected to expand their economies, uh, economic growth rate of about 5.3% for this upcoming year. Um, so if we're able to see this economic expansion continue in these areas, where we have the greatest number of people, and that's my opinion of what will happen, uh, then those extra people will have extra economic resources in order to be able to, to purchase your products. Now, the reason I think we should expect that to happen is because we have a, um, uh, a new economy thanks to the, to the Internet. You now have the ability, almost anywhere in the world, and, and certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, I've traveled in, in much of that area. You have the ability to uh, make a product, advertise it on the web, appear like you are maybe a very large company, even though you may only just be an individual working in your basement or in your, in, in your hut, maybe it's a better way, not a basement, but a hut. Um, and you're able to then get uh, payment for that product through MasterCard, and you're able to ship it by Federal Express. So you're able in sub-Saharan Africa to compete effectively with a small manufacturer in western Iowa. And as far as the buyer is concerned, uh, the, the ability to uh, purchase around the world uh, creates greater opportunities, uh, uh, greater product selection, and so to expect continued development in those areas I think is the right expectation. Uh, and so I think uh, uh, as we have seen in, in China, and in some other areas, as the, the, the availability of the Internet and as the availability to do business internationally uh, occurs, you can expect greater economic uh, uh, improvement. There's still plenty of land to bring into production, um, uh, so there's not a matter of whether we have the land or not. The question really is, how much money does it take to get that new land into production? And what happens in agriculture in this country or around the world, is as you have the profits and the availability of profit, then you find a little more ground to farm. And we see that in this country, and, and we see it certainly down in Brazil, uh, less so in some of the other uh, uh, European countries and so forth, but we still have the ability to uh, pick up additional ground, so we don't have to worry, we don't have a fear of running out of food, but we just have to have a price level to bring that ground into production. Now, of course, what happens if you bring it into production, you'll have a, a perhaps, if it's a large enough area for, for enough period of time, such as we've been seeing in Brazil, where they've got 
where they've had strong profit levels now for several years, there's been strong uh, uh, increases in, in plantings. Uh, so, uh, so we would expect that to, uh, uh, to continue, but again, when you have price levels like what we're experiencing today, we would actually expect some land to actually go idle. Um, if we look around the world and look at corn production now, you can see that the big guns in corn production is the United States and China. Um, the, uh, there's no profits to be made right now in South America uh, raising corn. Uh, so the likelihood is that, that the second half, the second season crop in Brazil will be uh, less than what was anticipated a few months ago. Um, if you look at uh, production in various areas, you can see that, that the increase in uh, metric tons per hectare uh, in that sub-Saharan Africa again, I keep focusing back there because that's where the population growth really looks to be uh, increasing in addition to areas in Asia. Um, the cereal production uh, is not going up in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But if you look around the whole world, you'll see that the total usage is also going to be a big new record. So uh, a big record of production um, uh, is not the only thing to look at here. The, the, the other side of this is, well, how much do we want and how much will we want over time? And, uh, and then the other question that we're trying to answer is, well, how much more does a billion people eat? How, how much, what does it take? And so there's the, there's the, the uh, uh, when we had six billion people and, uh, in 1999, and then in 2012, seven billion people. So you can see the kind of, of growth you'll have in coarse grain usage when you add a billion people, and the next billion from 2012, we're supposed to reach that by 2022. So in a 10-year window, uh, we're expected to uh, increase uh, uh, that graph uh, should increase from uh, that similar amount over the next 10-year window. Uh, if you look at uh, the areas where the, the corn is imported, who wants our crop? And you can see there that uh, 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 where the distribution is of demand. If you break it down on a country, what you'll see is lots of buyers. And if you analyze that uh, table a little bit, the buyers continue to increase the amount of, uh, of imports uh, generally across the whole uh, group. Now, we go back to the acreage issue in the United States. Notice how much U.S. acreage for the principal crops has moved based on profits over the, just the past few years. And you can see that, that we were, uh, when the profits uh, uh, dwindled, uh, we, we dropped uh, the total uh, planted acreage. When profits came back, we, we moved 10 million acres up. When the profits disappeared, back again, 10 million acres down. And then profits came back up 10 million acres, and now last year down just slightly. So when people say this year, well, we're going to have full production, big acreage on all the crops in the United States, that chart would suggest that's not the case. If the profits are not there, producers in this country idle back some ground. And they have done that repeatedly. And I would expect this year that the total plantings uh, would actually come down. And I would think they'd come down by maybe 5 million acres. That's currently not the forecast. The market is trading an increase in soybeans and a slight decrease in corn, but not a five million acre decrease across the, uh, the entire uh, uh, principal crop acreage. If you look at the, uh, the uh, demand again for, um, uh, well, first of all, understand last year's crop was a record yield for coarse grains, a record yield on rec record acreage. And if you look out and say, well, how much expansion in usage do we normally have? And, uh, and as you can see, uh, the, uh, the expansion um, uh, continued uh, throughout the entire 10-year period of uh, uh, population expansion. We added a billion people, and we added, I can't quite see that number, but it's, uh, um, you can, you can uh, uh, we're averaging about 2% per year increased demand um, during that window of, uh, of, of 1 billion people. So then I grabbed some other numbers, and you'll notice that from a 10-year window, just taken from 03 to 13, 
uh, up 2.6 percent, I think. And then if you just take the last five years, you can see uh, a similar expansion. So I'm just going to I'm going to guess that the world this next year is going to need two to three percent more coarse grain, and that represents 24. Uh, to 36 million tons of more coarse grain in this upcoming year. And so the question is, for those particularly people who are really negative to these markets, where are we going to find those additional bushels, those additional tons? And we can either do it by getting uh, more ground into production, which I think is really unlikely, or we're going to have to have really great yields in order to uh, to bring the numbers up to where they need to be to supply the, uh, the level of demand that we should have. Now, we could certainly draw into ending stocks, but if we're going to talk about doing that, we have to talk about prices going higher. So at the moment, the marketplace on corn and, uh, and, the, and the world marketplace on coarse grain uh, is a market that is negative because of supply. But as you look out forward, you can see we're going to have to keep increasing that supply 2 to 4%, and that's a challenge. That's the challenge that, that I think the market's going to struggle with, and I think there's going to be periods of time when we really don't have uh, the kind of expansion we need, or we worry about that expansion, in which case you're going to have prices. So the longer-term outlook, by, because of demand and the relative slowness that we can increase the production in the short term, uh, uh, will, I think, give us opportunities for some better price levels. Uh, ethanol, back up. Ethanol, uh, uh, that's a concern. So I, I switched the ethanol into a million metric tons so that you can kind of uh, keep this all in the same perspective. Um, and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, a part of uh, the uh, uh, energy business uh, is to uh, look at what's going on in propane. This is uh, from the Department of Energy report that came out on Wednesday. And you can see protein, propane supplies are well underneath the five-year average. And just this last week, you can see the big spike that we're seeing in wholesale prices. Uh, if, we, uh, if we look at uh, the, uh, uh, the DDGs, uh, this has been the real surprise this year. The DDGs have actually become more valuable than corn. And uh, there's a graph showing how much of the DDGs we export. And, uh, uh, and you can see where we are uh, through 11 months of uh, 2013. And then you can look and see that China is the biggest buyer. So, so China is not only buying corn, buying soybeans, they're also buying um, uh, DDGs. The, uh, if you look at uh, meat production, there's uh, the USDA forecast in January that uh, shows cattle numbers down, beef numbers down, and prices up uh, with the total meat uh, uh, production this year uh, slightly higher than last year. There's a corn yield chart for the United States, and, and although uh, last year we raised slightly above the trend line yield, you can see we really have struggled to make uh, significant advances. And I, I know that, that uh, uh, some of that uh, uh, is being held back by weather, probably most of it, because the technology is certainly improving as, as time is going along. Um, a picture uh, of... Uh, uh, Got here the uh, the ethanol grind that came out on Wednesday that we saw an increase in the in the ethanol grind uh, and uh, uh, but the stocks are starting to build uh, as we saw this last week. Uh, one of the problems we've had as we have moved our um, a lot of our corn into the ethanol uh, sector, uh, we have lost out in the export sector. And you can see competitive pressures have come in, and uh, we're losing export business uh, to uh, foreign competitors. And uh, that's starting to come back this year. But that's been a problem, and we're going to have to win that business back. Exports are running ahead of schedule on corn. Um, world coarse grain stocks, so we had a record production, and everybody acts like we have huge surpluses, but those are not big increases. Uh, in ending stocks relative to history. These are uh, relatively adequate stocks, but they're certainly not burdensome stocks. We do not have surpluses large enough to be able to uh, get through any kind of uh, crop problems in any major production area. We're going to be very tight uh, 
uh, if we have any kind of problem at all, we can pull those stocks down very quickly. In the U.S., we also have increasing stocks. But again, these are not the big burdensome stocks. And we're going to have to have uh, record production again this year in order to uh, keep that stocks number from actually being contracted. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, uh, March corn chart uh, as of uh, last night. Um, and you can see the market's been trending down really for about a year now. And uh, we use an oscillator system. And for those of you producers in here, if you don't have some kind of an oscillator system, um, take a look at ours. Because what we believe prices will oscillate from higher to lower, back to higher to lower. That, that there's a, a somewhat of a, of a rhythm to that. And so we measure it with this oscillator at the bottom uh, a fourth of that graph. And, and in the simple version of it is that if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the two horizontal lines, one at 25 and one at 75, anytime you get the, the blue and the red line uh, over the top, in our oscillator system, over the top of 75, we call it a sell signal. Uh, what we say is that the, the, uh, the market is up at a price area that's hard to sustain without ongoing weather problem or something else, and the market will cycle back down. And you can see there's been a regular pattern of that this year, and there has been really over, we've been doing this for about 20 years now, and the pattern is regular enough that we can utilize that to, to aid with marketing. And you'll notice that if you were to have made sales on each one of those, we call them again, sell signals, uh, you can see where the prices were at that time. And at each one of those times, the market was on an upward cycle. And following the sell signal in each one of those times, there was a fairly sharp decline. You'll notice that we had a sell signal on corn last week. And that was a, not much of a peak in the market, but it was the best peak that we've had uh, for a little bit. We had a sell signal back in December. You can see where that's at on the chart, too. So we haven't had much opportunity, but the oscillator program uh, continues to point out the places to make sales. Um, I think that uh, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting factoid, I call it, that people are circulating about how much corn could China buy if they just decided to do it. If they just decided to convert some of their money, uh, some of their uh, um, holdings of U.S. Treasuries, and you can see just 1% of that amounts to 73 million tons, and that's just a, a huge number. Um, as, as we look at the, the acreage again, uh, we think acreage is, will fall if we don't see some profit improvement. Um, we think the winter price lows are in right now and that we should see some firming as we move into the spring, depending on weather. Um, I think you have to readjust your profit expectations if you're in production agriculture. We're not going to have the unusual kind of, of years that we've had here in recent years with the very high prices. We're going to have to grow that uh, business back up again. Uh, and uh, it would seem to me that the, uh, um, the price levels that we're looking at now are toward the low side of where I think the, uh, uh, we should be. Although, if we were to have a very strong harvest this year in most of the, uh, most of the world, we could sure have uh, a low made at harvest time, and that low could well be the bottom of our new plateau, if you will. I don't think it's as low as some people are expecting, but we could certainly be under pressure. And again, we must raise big crops to satisfy growing demand. I'm just going to touch quickly on wheat. Uh, you can see where uh, production occurs. You can also see uh, uh, who's exporting the wheat. Uh, total usage is a record. And if we look back at that uh, period of time when we added a billion people, you can see that the growth in demand uh, was substantial. And again, if we take that out another 10 years, that we should duplicate that if these population estimates are correct. Uh, world wheat ending stocks uh, are about even with last year, actually, and certainly not what you would call real burdensome supplies. Uh, winter wheat acreage has already uh, uh, been uh, estimated by the government a couple times. And you can see that the acreage is coming down just a little bit. And uh, wheat ending stocks in the United States also not tight at all. Uh, we're actually, or not loose, not substantial at all. We're actually relatively tight. Uh, we've only been tighter than this a couple, three times. So the wheat market deserves to have some recovery 
not only because of the cold weather we're seeing in here, but because of the tightening supplies uh, that, uh, that we expect to see uh, this fall. Shifting over to soybeans, you can see where the production occurs, and it's primarily the United States and South America, led by Brazil. Brazil this year raised about the same number of uh, uh, bushels uh, as the United States. And then on the uh, uh, demand side of it, uh, or sorry, this shifts over to all oil seeds in addition to soybeans. You see some increased uh, numbers there. Uh, uh, and if you look at the exporters, you can see uh, that the, the growth in exports is really all occurring uh, out of Brazil. Total usage will be a new record this year in the world. And again, if we look at that and say, well, how many more do we need to supply the billion people? You can see it's a fairly substantial increase. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, if we look at uh, those numbers again and try to get some percentage increases, you can see that looking at several different uh, time horizons, uh, what the growth has been. And, and so I think we'll, we'll need two to four million uh, or two to four percent more soybeans next year, which is five to ten million tons uh, of uh, additional production. That will probably be easier to get because there's going to be uh, quite a bit of switching from feed grains over to corn. Uh, now you can see who's buying the beans. And one of the things you'll notice here is that we don't have much expansion in demand from anybody other than China. So that's a, it's a one country market, and we have to be a little bit careful about that uh, because if anything goes wrong in China, that's really going to impact our soybeans. Exports are running ahead of schedule. Ending stocks are growing. They're going to be about the third biggest ever, but again, uh, the, uh, uh, we have to raise a big crop again next year. There's a U.S. yield number. Uh, there's a, a picture of uh, the... Uh, uh, the March soybeans, and you'll notice there that uh, similar kind of a picture. If you use an oscillator, uh, you'll have opportunities to make sales on, on uh, price peaks and avoid sales on price valleys. That market's an upward sloping market. Um, you'll see prices, the lows, the recent lows are above the earlier lows, and we're down threatening those lows again this morning. So uh, we're worried about beans because we're just right into the harvest in Brazil. And as they increase their harvest, they will take away our business. I think we have one more rally in beans, but we need to hold these lows in here. And the, and the market uh, uh, is acting uh, very soft this morning. Ending stocks, the United States are going to be tight. Soybean outlook, uh, we'll have strong U.S. demand until the Brazilian crop comes on stream. It's already started, but it's really a slow go this early in the season. Um, we're going to uh, uh, pressure our winter, uh, late winter and spring prices, we're afraid, with that crop. And uh, uh, we look for additional acreage due to the profit situation. Uh, but again, we must raise a big crop. I'm just going to throw rice in so you can see the growth in rice. Cotton was the only crop we raised in the world that did not set a record last year. And just touch for just a second on Patrick's subject here for, for weather. Uh, the, uh, uh, the drought monitor shows uh, increasing drought situation coming in the western part of the country. Um, this is a map of Brazilian soybean production, so you can see what the important area is. You'll notice the red circle. That's the biggest production area, and that's their, the weather that they've experienced uh, uh, through the uh, uh, month of December. And you can see they've actually had fairly good... Uh, uh, rainfall and good-looking crops. Here's Argentina. Look at the red circle again. There's two of them there. And the weather there, you can see, is a little more troublesome. It's been dry in, in many areas of uh, southern Argentina, uh, and we're worried a little bit about their crops. El Nino is neutral, and uh, uh, we think that farmers should be following this kind of a marketing plan, which is we make sales in the spring uh, into the early summer. We don't in the fall and we come back and make sales again in the, in the spring, summer, and we follow those sell signals uh, to give us the timing of when to make those sales. And I think I'm going to turn it over to you, Ken. John, you're in your zone, and I do appreciate you talking to us about this. Let me get you outside of it a little bit, but 
with the fact that you have seen much of the world and anticipate this when you go there, you talk about Africa and the huge increases in population. What about increasing production by modern methods in Africa? Uh, is that a prospect or is all of their increase in uh, food supply going to come from other countries? We saw the cereal, the yield on their, the cereal production in sub-Saharan Africa. Africa, it's only, it's coming up very, very slowly. Uh, political situations there are going to make it very difficult for them to increase their um, uh, uh, production uh, uh, in, in, until things start to change, until something really starts to drive it hard. Uh, so no, I don't think Africa will be able to increase the supply itself. It's, they're going to need to be buying uh, in the world market. No, I don't. It's next to talk. I'll enjoy uh, talks like yours. Uh, I, I, from a weather point of view, uh, in the United States, California's lack of rain uh, is being driven by a persistent ridge and jet stream, which also lies of gosh darn cold in the eastern half of the country. Uh, for over a year, computer models have been trying to predict an El Nino, which would increase the precipitation in California in the second half of the winter. But reality doesn't seem to be uh, agreeing with that. We're over halfway through the California rainy season. So if I said to you, I think there's a pretty good probability that they're not going to, as they have in some years, have a big catch up in the last half of the rainy season there. How do you back that? Well, I'm not sure that California is, you know, is, is really the key to the Midwest kind of agricultural production. Um, I'm saying but, prices. But, uh, and, and, and same thing. I, it's not a big area of demand or a big area of supply. So I'm, I, I'm not sure that that will have much impact. If it moves to the east, if we start seeing, uh, or let me just say it different, if we continue to see this dry pattern uh, throughout the, the main corn production area, uh, we're going to have a problem. I mean, I, as I talk with farmers, uh, I've talked to some here, but, but uh, every day. Farmers around the entire Midwest are worried about uh, how dry the soils are and how they're going to need to get some catch-up rain to get the, the soils restocked. That's what gave us the crop last year. We replenished all the subsoil moisture. It let us go through a long, dry period. So I guess my question back to you, uh, uh, Patrick, would be, do you see this dry condition moving toward us? I mean, do you see this dry pattern continuing, or do you see it starting to improve? No, what, what happens, as opposed to California, when we transition out of the winter cold cyclone regime, where the low pressure systems come by, and we transition into the thunderstorm derived precipitation of the late spring, uh, those are much more spotty, and it's very, very difficult to predict whether you're going to have an above normal or below normal. But really, the name of the game here is going to be what happens after about March 1st. Uh, I see no reason a priori to say that it's going to be horrific. Uh, I see no reason to say it's going to catch up. Let's just assume it's going to be average and do your forecast from there. Well, and, and, and what, what I think is that the, the pattern that we've seen so far, if it continues, is going to give us some scare. It's going to give us a scare. And, and, so, and now whether that scare turns into a real reduction or not, I don't know. But from a standpoint of, of trying to market a crop, what you're looking for is you're saying, okay, is this just a straight downward slope? There's a lot of people saying sell all your new crop corn because it's going to go straight to zero or something, something just short of that. Uh, I think that's foolish because I think that the demand is strong enough that when we start focusing on next year's supplies and next year's ending stock, we're going to say, well, wait a minute. The likelihood is these are going to come down with good weather. Now, what happens if we have any kind of weather problem and people will start to focus on that a little bit, and then there will be a weather problem. There will be something that it doesn't rain for a week, doesn't rain for two weeks, three weeks. Pick, pick your time frame, and the market will be very quick to respond. And I guess that's my whole point with that. The market will be quick to respond to any kind of weather issue, which is normal. That's just normal. John, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Question here. Yeah, yeah John, first of all, I have to, I'm very impressed that you still have a resume from Lincoln Grain. You don't hear that very much anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as, as prices decline, 
the marginal acres that came into produc production will start to come back out of production. My question is, because it ties into this whole thing today, where in the U.S. or more importantly the Midwest are those marginal acres at that are going to come back out of production as these prices come back down? That are going to come out of production? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, rather than looking and saying, okay, well, where's it at? Here, sp sp point it out to me. All that I'm suggesting here is we've done that twice now over the, in the last decade. We have pulled the acreage down 10 million acres and then popped it back up and then back down 10 million acres and then popped it back up again. So if we're able to do it just a few years ago, why wouldn't we be able or why wouldn't we expect to do it in the upcoming year and the upcoming year beyond? In other words, if price levels stay down as some people are forecasting, my, my argument is we won't get the acreage. Now, when somebody says, well, where are they going to come out at? Uh, and, okay, so you can start drilling down and trying to identify and so forth. I've not tried to do that. When you start trying to do that, it's, it's very difficult to identify that. But if you look at what the trend is, in past years, when the profits came down to where people were not able to make any money, somebody pulled their acres out of production. And they did that not many years ago, and my argument is we'll do it again. Uh, where those acres will be specifically, we may all be surprised. I mean, but, but that's, that's what I anticipate. John, we I got a question back here. Down. Yes. John, uh, how can a person do any long-range planning on this uh, pricing of grain when these uh, suppliers are running hand-to-mouth so close anymore. Our carryover supply and our markets, they, we, just because we've got a supply right now, the market is going down because of that reason. We're so tight on supplies that we shouldn't have these prices we got. But so how can you do a long-range planning for, let's say, the 2014 crop when we're running hand-to-mouth so tight? Well, I, I think that... that uh, um, Long-range planning and the 2014 crop are two different things. Uh, the 2014 crop is a crop that we've uh, uh, been able to make sales on now for, for actually the last couple years. Uh, but, but from right here, I think that the, what you have to do is you have to find something that you're able to work with. You're not going to find it in the fundamentals. You're going to find it in some sort of a technical program that signals when markets are making a peak and when markets are making a valley. And, and, and we have an oscillator that we, that we rely upon and does exactly that. And it gives us a sell signal. Uh, in corn last year, I think we had nine. In soybeans, I think we had eight. So I don't know what that price is going to be, but I have confidence in that particular oscillating program that when I get those peaks, I'm going to be willing to make some sales. Now the question becomes one of, will we get any peaks? for the 214 crop. I mean, that's what everybody's asking. Do I have to sell today, or am I going to have a better opportunity out here in the next 90 or 120 days? And my argument is, you'll have a better opportunity. You'll have an opportunity when we get worried a little bit about weather. Now, whether that weather, whether that, if that weather turns into something that's really um, uh, long-lasting, okay, now we can start to talk about longer-term kind of things. But at the moment, as Patrick said, we've got to assume normal. So as you're doing your planning, planning, assume normal. And as the market cycles up, take a look at that price level and you're going to have to make a decision. I know you're not going to like it. Okay, that's the first. I know you won't. Okay, it's not going to be high enough that you're going to like it. But you're going to have to decide, do I take it or wait for the next one? Do I take it or wait for the next one? And the only thing I can say so far in the last month, in the last 12 years, or last 12 months, don't miss any of them. Take every one of those peaks and sell a few bushels, and the number will depend, I think, on what your situation is. A, am I making any money on the sale? B, do I have storage to hold it next fall if, if I don't sell it? You know, C, what's my crop doing out in the field? But you need to be ready, to, your, your long-term planning is longer term, and that agriculture, I think, is on, on a great footing because of this growth in demand. But your four, 2014 crop is short term, sell the peaks. Sell each one of these peaks. John, I got a question did, I answer, here. did I answer your question? I've got a question here in my assistant over there, Cannon. He's got a microphone as well. And, Sarah, I'll come to you in a minute. What's your question? 
you mentioned that the developing countries don't have enough income to increase production in their own countries. How are they going to even have enough money to buy our product in those same impoverished countries? Because what I've seen over the years, those countries are more than willing to let those people starve. Well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't expect to see them change substantially in how they're treating their people, you know, and, but if you're growing at 6% per year, somebody there is making money and there is some sort of a trickle-down effect, and so you do actually create demand in those areas. But remember, all we're looking at here is we're saying, this is what happened in the 10-year period of time when we put in, when we added a billion people. This is what happened to usage. Do you expect it to be less for the next billion people? I don't think so. I don't think so. I would think that if anything, it might actually even be more. Because what we're, what we're doing is we're exporting the U.S. For, for, I'll just call it the McDonald's. We're exporting our McDonald technology in there. And so that's part of what's had done this. And all we're going to do is more of that. So uh, I, I think sometimes you have to look at the really bigger picture and not try to get down and say, well, how are they going to do it? Who's going to cut the acres? Who's going to add the acres? Where are they going to get the money? Are they going to let the people starve? And all? In the last 10 years, from 99 to 12, this is what we did in, in usage. Okay? All I'm suggesting is from 12 to 22, we're going to do it again. Okay? Now, you might argue and say, well, wait a minute. That's too big. It's only this much. Okay, I'm fine with that. But the suggestion is getting this much more means agriculture has to stay on a very strong footing because you'll only pull ground and technology in if profits are available. Yeah. John, I have a question. Um, kind of the big picture in terms of what's going to happen with the corn bean mix, if, we, if you see anything, um, if that, that historical mix changing, and part, part of the thesis I'm wondering about, you mentioned the, the b additional billion people, but I'm wondering about... Um, the, the rise in corn being driven by people, the other five billion people, the percentage of those people are, who are eating up higher up the, uh, the food chain. And so is that source of protein going to change at all, are we, you know, the, that, that mix between the corn and the beans? And, and what about throwing in the, uh, the ethanol into the equation where you've got DDGs serving as a replacement for, for, some, of that pro, um, for some of that protein? Big question. Uh, what we've seen happen clearly is South America has taken over the soybean production uh, and the North America continues to be the, the main producer of corn. Uh, that's likely to continue. We're likely to give up soybean production to South America. That's kind of their crop. They figured out how to raise that crop. They figured out how to get good yields and they're expanding acreage and on that new acreage they put in soybeans. So my expectation would be that we continue to lose the soybean uh, 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 soybeans to South America and we and we are going to continue to be the strong corn producers um, now how does ethanol figure into that we've probably reached some sort of a plateau in ethanol uh, and uh, uh, whether we're able to get the E15 and we're able to move through this blend wall or not we'll just have to see what the politics are on that but uh, uh, what we're seeing is that it's not just ethanol that comes out of one of those plants. It's also DDGs. It has a very strong value to it. And so it's not as big of a draw as, uh, as people have uh, been claiming who didn't take that feed into the consideration. John, a question on an issue that's up now, and that is the unapproved corn that uh, China is rejecting, both in corn grain and DDGs. Is that a short-term issue? Is it science? Is it consumer issues there? Or is it just marketing? Well, I think it's a combination of all those things. I mean, I think that the, the first step of it uh, is that the, the Chinese decided they want to want to back the price down a little bit. The Chinese are pretty good at playing the market and playing the emotions of the market. And if you just, if you just reject a couple of cargoes or a few cargoes, what you do is you change the market and you break the market down, which is in their advantage. So, so I think that's the, the first part of it. Uh, the second part of it, the, 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 uh, over time, uh, we've just uh, 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 continued to see greater and greater acceptance um, of uh, bio-engineered uh, 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 
uh, uh, production. And so I think that over time that, that, that it, that's fine. I think it's a small issue that's, that's being blown a little out of proportion. Is there anything to it in the Chinese consumer market of these middle class people, I think you were referring to, that are concerned about what they're eating? That could back up on us, whether their government approves these or not. Possible. Uh, we really haven't seen it. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 what, we've, what we've actually seen is we've just seen continued increased demand uh, coming out of China. So, uh, but it's sure possible, it's sure possible. Well, John Roach, always a pleasure. And I know you had 17 cell signals last year, Coach. You call me with every one of them. <laughs> this is John Roach with a cell signal on corn or soybeans. <laughs> no, you have a great marketing effort and great expertise, and we thank you very much for being here. I'm sure people want to visit with you individually as well. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. John Roach. All right, we are on time.